This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. All right, so let's talk about an update in the Elderwood Games trademark. Okay, so I've already shot much of this video, but we wanted to make a bigger update than we did in that video. So why don't we take a look at what the current status is Let's see, so we've received one extension of time to oppose, and that is ours. That's, that's it. Oh, and Metallic Dice Games, wait a second here, wait a second here, okay. So we've got two extensions of time to oppose. A 90-day extension is likely from Metallic Dice Games, and that extension looks like it was granted, and our 30-day extension for Chris Taylor and it looks like that was granted as well. So we have two. We now have two opposers to the uh, to the Elderwood Games Hexbox trademark. Now remember, this is just a trademark on the interior shape of the top and the bottom of the box. And it's very specific in that they want this diamond shape and the seven hexagons in this particular arrangement and the cutout for the magnet. So it's, it's, it's this shape, it's these arrangements of, of shapes, and it's nothing more than that. It's a very broad trademark for what they're asking for. The only limitation that I can find is that it's at least only for dice boxes. It's not going to be on car tires or something. If you put this pattern into your tread pattern of your car tire, I'd still say it's likely functional, but that's not going to be in the same category, so you're going to be fighting a different trademark fight if you're fighting a trademark fight. So where are we then today? Well, I got word from our trademark attorney, Marina Lewis, last week, literally 20 minutes before we finished the Elderwood update live stream. And that was too soon for me to be comfortable asking for, for, for more money or telling you what the update was about. Um, Marina worked very hard on her analysis and I'm still waiting for us to coordinate an official opposition message that we want to put out. So I'm going to put out this update instead. We are 100% go to oppose the Elderwood trademark. It's all the things that we said that it doesn't function as a trademark, it functions as like a design patent or something. That the box itself is functional in a way. Now, I don't want to go over the specific details we're going to attack until we actually have something written up and substantiated and we have our citations in order and our opposition is basically ready to go. It's not that that won't be public. We just want it to be public then. And we don't want to reveal the results of our research and everything until we actually have all the results of our research. But our preliminary professional research by an actual trademark litigator shows that we are good to go on that opposition. So what we are asking for is you to help out. Send us your evidence. We want articles and fan materials that show how Elderwood's box was crafted specifically to accommodate utility aspects of playing D&D and other tabletop games. In other words, the profile of 1D20 is a hexagon. So, hey, uh, maybe there's something about keeping the dice nice and separate in a dice box. Um, the hexagonal shape might have something to do with it. The fact that it divides the dice you know, apart might have something to do with it. The number of dice, how many dice do you use in D&D these days? I, don't, I haven't played tabletop games in a while, sorry guys. Uh, so maybe you use exactly seven dice or something like that. So send us your evidence that you find either of your materials or articles that you see that talk about how Elderwood's box and these kinds of boxes are made to be functional more than anything. Also, send us evidence of yourself or other sellers or artists or gamers use of these shapes and specifically 
Elderwoods uh, applied for a shape, which is, again, this very specific one. Now, we say it's... Uh, I'm still concerned that they're going to try and claim more than just this very specific shape. I think they're also going to try and claim anything that is confusingly similar, which is the the point or the obligation of having a trademark. If something is confusingly similar, you have more or less an obligation to pursue that as a trademark infringement action, or at least come to some agreement with that party. You can't just let it sit out there unmitigated. So if somebody else makes a box that's hexagonal shaped and has these cutouts in this similar, but not exactly the same, if it's confusingly similar to a consumer, to, to a reasonable consumer who is interested in purchasing one of these boxes, then that's going to be something that Elderwood would also own the right to pursue. Something else people um, could let us know is, you know, if they have a similar design that maybe now you're concerned about selling it because you don't want a claim from these people or yes. maybe you've sold this in the past maybe in the 90s you know you were making these boxes and, yeah uh you want to let us know it's like you know they didn't invent that design exactly so send us your evidence of other sellers artists gamers prior use and sales of this kind of box especially if it's exactly this shape of box uh, and, or with this exact interior or with something very similar or at least something confusing, confusingly similar um, or really just generic shapes as well that, that, you've, that you've seen sold in the past that are like our hex box. So anything that you think is relevant, send it to us. I'll give you an email address at the end of this thing. Um, we also want evidence of when Elderwood actually began selling this hex box with this interior design. We found their Kickstarter, but that doesn't mean that that's when they were actually selling it. Uh, we want to know when they started delivering it and when they started taking orders. So the Kickstarter is kind of like a taking an order maybe, but how about when they actually started making them and shipping them? That's not quite the same thing to just take orders as it is to start delivering them. So we want to make sure we have the timing locked down of when they were doing that. And what we have been able to accomplish so far, we have a commitment from our trademark attorney to charge us approximately $2,000 to start the opposition process. So just to file the opposition action will be somewhere around $1,500 for the attorney and somewhere around $400 for the filing fee. And we'll go from there. What, what is really awesome is that we have already met this goal. We have raised now $3,355 before GoFundMe fees, including $500 today from Jim Sloan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sloan. I don't, I, I don't know who Jim Sloan is. I, maybe, maybe they're a big, a big fan, or maybe they're another company who, who couldn't oppose themselves. Uh, I'm really grateful to Jim for that donation, as well as the rest of you here, because this is absolutely awesome that everyone has has donated so much to this effort and what i'm going to do then is raise the requested amount to five thousand dollars because we need to start preparing for the next step of opposition then so this is this is my version of if you give me six hours to chop down a tree i'll spend the first four sharpening the axe if we have the $5,000 by the time we get to the point where we need it, I can reassure our attorneys that we are not going to run out of money prematurely. And if we need more than that, well, I'm told that the estimated opposition fees are around $15,000, could go up from there depending upon how much we need to hire people for research or expert opinions or something like that. There's also a possibility that instead of fighting this in the USPTO, the Patent and Trademark Office, or the Trademark Trial and Appeals Board, that someone can file just a federal lawsuit over it instead, which is different than, it's it's similar as in the rules of evidence and stuff apply, but it's also, it's at a different court then, and you need to use a different level of prosecution or defense. So it could go up from there, depending on how much Elderwood really wants to spend on this. We're hoping that some point along the way, they'll come to their senses, my opinion, and will drop the thing or agree to some other level of trademark 
that we won't oppose. I, I'm still firmly on the side of if they just did like one more thing, I'd be fine with it. If they didn't claim the shape of the interior of the box, but rather claimed a box with an Elderwood Games logo on it or something, that would be completely different for me. I would much rather see them trademark their logo, which is what people do. But I think what they're trying to do is get a monopoly on a box by making it a shape and then trying to bully people out of the market with their trademark and patent and copyright claims. So it is my professional opinion that they are acting in too aggressive a manner. So that's why I've called them tabletop bullies in the past. But I'm not trying to say that they're doing anything illegal. I'm trying to say that I disagree with their level of aggression over such a simple box. It's a legal difference of opinion, and I'd like to see it play out in the courts, not be won by somebody overspending over another party, like a, a, a larger corporation or larger organization spending, outspending the little guy, basically. As you saw from Chris Taylor, he had his, his father had died and left them a lot of debt. I'm not even sure how it all worked. You can go back and watch his live stream with us, but there was some legal shenaniganery going that managed to make him indebted to the city of Philadelphia or the county of Philadelphia or something like that. And he had to pay off about $200,000 of his father's debt before he was free and clear to leave. And he couldn't afford to live in Pennsylvania anymore. So he gutted a school bus and put all his stuff in it and drove it across the country, which is really innovative. And that's something I would do. Like if I needed to move across the United States and I couldn't afford five or ten thousand dollars for a moving van, which I can't, I would probably just rent a big truck or in his case, maybe bought an old school bus. And even if you put a little bit of money into the school bus, it's still a big, big vehicle that you can just load up with all your stuff and just go. I don't I don't know whether he made like a mini like a, like a tiny house out of the school bus or if he just gutted it and then loaded it up and drove. But that's what he had to do. So that's what, that's what we're talking about. Elderwood went after this guy because they didn't like that he wanted to sell or make the same kind of box that they were making. Nothing more. It didn't, he wasn't selling or making a box with an Elderwood logo on it. He was just selling or making a, a hexagonal box with the same pattern on the inside that the same pattern of cutouts, not, the, not like the same decorative pattern, but the same pattern of cutouts. So I don't think that's fair. I think they're bullies and we'd like your help in opposing them. So I'm going to ask for $5,000 now in the GoFundMe and we're going to start on the opposition. We probably will have the opposition filed before the 30 days is up, but we'll see people get busy. There's lots of things happening. I'm representing in the Wyckoff case. I'm getting ready to enter my appearance. So I mean, I'm not needed for the Chris Taylor thing aside from, uh, from, from raising the money and making sure that trademark counsel has what they need. So let us know what you think. And please, like I said, send us evidence with articles and fan materials that show how this or other boxes are crafted specifically to accommodate the tabletop gameplay, the utility aspects, the useful functional aspects of D&D gameplay, like storing hexagonally shaped dice in, separately in a hexagonally shaped box, or seven dice coming with most D&D kits, and so you need seven cutouts in a box. So that seems very functional to me. That will be one of our arguments, I'm sure. What I'm not going to do is go into further depth because I don't want to give anyone, I don't want to give anything away yet until we know exactly what our arguments are going to be. Uh, we also want to see evidence of other sellers and artists and gamers use and sales of these kinds of boxes, either from Elderwood or from others, especially before the 2014 date. I think it was 2014. Let's check it out real quick. Um, their application was 2018, but their first use in commerce 
was 2000 was October 2nd, 2014. So we need to know what was going on October 2nd, 2014. Is that, is that just is that just their Kickstarter date or were they actually shipping you boxes with this exact pattern on the inside on October 2nd, 2014? And then we want to know when did they actually begin to sell and deliver them to customers. So if you've got a box that's from a prior time, from an earlier time, and it's not made by Elderwood, we'd like to know all about that. Send that to us at ljfrench at leonardjfrench.com. That's L-J-F-R-E-N-C-H at L-E-O-N-A-R-D-J-F-R-E-N-C-H.com. And we'll be happy to hear about your, your, your experiences. Um, Please understand that as pleased as I am about you sending stuff in, we are receiving a lot of stuff and I can't necessarily reply to everybody. And then some things definitely fall through the cracks and I don't reply because I didn't see it or something. So I'm going to be going through and carefully triaging all of that. But if I somehow missed your reply or, or didn't reply to you or something, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's not, it, I don't mean this to be like a, you know, a fan thing like, oh, thank you for being a fan. This is more like uh, we need to get all this material together as quickly as possible and get it to our trademark attorney. So I might be focusing on that. So what do you think? Let us know. Go to our GoFundMe and donate if you can. And we will we will oppose this trademark as best we can with the resources we're given, and we might actually be able to, to accomplish something with this one. If you donate and we end up not needing all of the money, I will be working with Chris Taylor to figure out who to then donate the money to. Something like an EFF organization. It might even be the EFF. I'm just not committing to it yet. What I can guarantee is that it's not going to be kept by Mr. Taylor or kept by me. Yeah, so I just want to stress again, if you're a fan and you'd like to contact us, there is a way you can do that. Um, this is not what that's for. So like like Leonard said, the LJ French email address, that's for legal legal documents, legal inquiries, and that's it. If you'd like to contact us as a fan, you're welcome to do so at business at lawfulmasses.com. Uh, we read those emails. If you if you want to send in a story or you just want to thank us, uh, we read those emails. So feel free to send that there. All right. And someone has just pointed out that Metallic Dice Games does have a silicone dice case that is round, but still has a similar hexagonal pattern on the inside. And so I don't know if that is a violation of any kind, or if they've been approached by Elderwood Games about, you know, not doing this, but uh, they did oppose, or they did ask for an extension to oppose the Elderwood trademark on the docket here of the USPTO website. It says it right here, Metallic Dice Games, Mitchell Gani Gane. I, I don't know. Sorry, Mitchell. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. So we now have two parties who are interested in opposing and have preserved their right to do so. So that's really cool. If if we don't, if we aren't successful on our opposition, it's still possible for Metallic Dice Games as they have ninety days. We'll see how we'll see where that goes. I'm really stoked about that, but it's also not my forte, so I'm leaving this to the trademark attorneys to fight this one out, and I'm just helping raise the money. And thank you very much for that. I am absolutely floored by having raised $3,355 in, what, has it been two weeks? Two weeks and a couple days? That's really cool. Remember, the theories of our opposition are that you can't trademark functional objects, you can't trademark basic shapes. And one answer that I did get, which was sort of the source of the title of this video, is you can't saddle the opposing party with your attorney's fees and costs. In other words, we can oppose this trademark without any fear that Elderwood could come back at us and sue us for the costs of them responding to any opposition. Now that's something we're still making sure, but that's my initial research and our attorney's initial research is that there's absolutely no way they could come back at us and sue us for some kind of costs or something from 
opposing their trademark. So that's good. That's a that's a real good one. That's a big barrier taken down. So the thing is, though, they told us that they were going to try that. And so that's why I'm calling them tabletop bullies. I'm hearing from more and more people that they've issued patent based takedowns for this hex dice box, that they've issued copyright takedowns for this hex dice box, that they've intimidated other vendors at conventions over the hex dice box, and of course that they've issued trademark based takedowns over the hex dice box. So this is just an opinion. I'm not trying to defame anyone, but this is what we've heard, and these are the motivating factors for why we want to oppose their trademark on this hex dice box that is here in this application. Remember, this is what they're applying for. This design here, I think you can see my cursor, this design here is the extent of the trademark. This is not the outside of the box. This is the inside of the box. And those shapes are the shapes of the cutouts in the box. I was walking along the market street here. I forget which, what it's called in Esh Ualzekt. And Kaylee and I were talking about jewelry boxes, not because we need a jewelry box. I don't wear any jewelry. I think she has literally like two items of jewelry that she wears mostly, and they're from me. They're the pendant that I gave her and they're the ring that I gave her. But like, let's imagine a hypothetical where we needed a jewelry box. Could I really go to a jewelry box store and they would say, oh, well, you can't get this one box that's got eight slots in the top and six in the middle and, and eight on the bottom because someone's trademarked a box with eight slots in the top and six slots in the middle and eight slots in the bottom. Now, if I was Stephen MacArthur opposing counsel, he might say, yeah, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about trade dress and all that. But it sort of is. On one hand, they have made an arrangement that you see here of cutouts in the box. Oh, is our, our, our bread is ready. Oh God, I'll be right back. <laughs> All right, we'll give that a second to upload. We apparently just destroyed the bread that we were trying to make. This is what has happened to our bread. <laughs> it looks like the bread started rising and baking and then the thing mixed or something and yeah. just cut it up completely. The corners might be delicious. Have you tried it yeah, yet? Yeah, we're gonna try, we're gonna, we might it. <laughs> and? It tastes nice. It tastes nice, she says. I was saying that Kaylee and I were walking along and talking about jewelry boxes and could you really trademark eight slots in the top, six slots in the middle, eight slots in the bottom. And, and no, that alone I don't think is enough for trademark. And this is just a different arrangement of box holes. Uh, does it make a difference whether the box hole is square or if it's circular or if it's hexagonal? Certainly, if you add a decorative thing, like if this pattern here was like laser engraved onto the outside of the box and has no function, I don't see how that's a problem. And I really feel like Elderwood and I are really standing next to one another, but on opposite sides of the line. If they just added something to their box to give it a decorative uh, design, then that would be part of a trademark where you would be able to say only boxes that have this decorative design can be sold by Elderwood. Not only boxes that have this interior design can be sold by Elderwood. The interior design isn't even visible from the outside when the box is closed and sitting on the shelf. And the packaging for the box, I'm not even sure there is any packaging for it, but I haven't seen any packaging for the box that literally says, look for our unique internal hexagonal design, which it would, that's closer to what the trademark examining attorney said they needed. So what we've done so far is engage a experienced trademark attorney to tell us whether this is a good idea or not. If it only costs us a few hundred dollars to have an attorney tell us that we are completely nuts 
and this is a bad idea and don't go forward, that's freaking cheap. And that's a good idea. You want to engage an attorney to tell you when something is a bad idea before you go down the road and, and learn the hard way and get yourself a several hundred thousand dollar judgment or something like could have been had in the Matt Haas case. You remember the Haas v. Klein case, the H3H3 case, where it was later determined that the Kleins had made a quintessential fair use of Matt Haas's video. They had $150,000 in legal fees that we even know about. I think it was it might have been even higher than that. And but that's because they engaged good copyright counsel who were capable of handling that case. You might remember they hired Ryan Morrison and his law partner, I forget, Lee, Michael Lee, I think. And for some reason, we don't know why, but they changed over to new copyright counsel. And that was a, you know, whether or not that was a good idea, it resulted in the outcome that we got. So that's, that was a, ultimately it was, a, you know, it worked out. And you can imagine going down that road without knowing if it was a good idea and spending all that money not knowing if it was a good idea. No, you want to hire somebody first to triage the matter and figure out whether it's a good idea. So the first thing we've done is ask someone to do a deep analysis, deeper than we can do, deeper than I know how to do. And why? Why would we have to do this? Doesn't law school prepare every attorney for every legal question they could ever be asked? No. And this is why we have lawyers who practice in niche areas or become not, we, we can't say the word expert. There's literally a rule of professional conduct that says you can't call yourself an expert unless you have, unless there's very specific areas of expertise that are, that are approved by the various state bars and the American Bar Association. So you can't say, I'm an expert in copyright law, for example. Can't say that. Um, you can't go around saying, I'm an expert in tax law. Now, you, now, there might be a expert certification, and you might be able to say, I've become certified in copyright law, whatever, through this program. But you can't just go around saying, I'm an expert without having that additional education. The bar, the various bars, do not want attorneys trying to say they're smarter or better or more expert in this case than other attorneys. So what uh, the phrasing I'll use is someone more competent. Every attorney is supposed to be able to become competent. Their law school education and their learning and their, their intelligence, their issue spotting, their passing the bar is everything that qualifies them. Their moral character qualifies them to be an attorney. Believe it or not, attorneys have to pass a moral character examination as well which is not a test. It's more of a background check. Uh, it's an extensive background check. So lawyers pass these various legal requirements, become an attorney and a, li a licensed attorney and can practice in anything they would like. They can even get themselves in trouble by practicing in something that they're not quite familiar with. I, I tried practicing bankruptcy law and I got out of it when I realized that it was going to be that I was getting in over my head. I didn't get in any trouble, but I did get a phone call from the DOJ once. What are you doing in this case? You've messed something up. And I had to go find a better, more competent bankruptcy attorney to tell me what I had messed up because the DOJ isn't exactly forthcoming with, you have to do this, 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 and this. And that attorney literally asked me, uh, were they angry at you on the phone or were they helpful? And I said, well, they were mostly helpful. They just wanted me to fix some things. Like, oh, good, 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 good. They're not, they're, they're, nobody's coming after you. You just have to fix some things. And then he explained what I had to fix. And it was very nice. And I would, I definitely referred clients to that uh, attorney when, when I stopped practicing bankruptcy law. We'll see what, uh, what, what we can either get Elderwood to agree to, or if they are dead set on going forward with their trademark application, then we may be forced to continue to oppose. So we'll see what happens with that. Until then, I am calling this tabletop bullies because Elderwood seems to have engaged in uh, oppositions and takedowns and things that, that I would describe, in my opinion, as bullying. And I don't appreciate that from a legal perspective. That motivates me more than just money. I'm not getting paid for this, by the way. I'm motivated by this doesn't feel right you shouldn't be able to squash the little guy this way.
It's one thing to use intellectual property laws to gain an approved monopoly over your intellectual property for the appropriate period of time. A trademark is a perpetual monopoly. Remember, a trademark doesn't expire. So long as they continue to sell this dice box, they have the right to this dice box exclusively. So if they get this trademark and there's no further opposition, they will eventually have the permanent right to make these dice boxes and no one else can come along and make a hexagonal dice box with this interior. Now, could, could we figure out a different way to make an arrangement of hexagons in a box? It's possible. I, I, I'm assuming that there's different ways to put hexagons in a box, but I don't see how that changes the analysis. I'll wait until our trademark council tells us whether that's a viable alternative or not. Maybe it becomes a thing where Elderwood can sell this hex dice box uh, as long as they only make this design and others can make a very similar design as long as it's not confusingly similar. But isn't that the next step? I mean, think about this. If they get a trademark on hexagons inside a dice, in, inside a hexagon dice box, and I go and make a hexagon shaped dice box with hexagons inside, but they're slightly arranged differently, is that really going to be not confusing for consumers? No, I think any arrangement of hexagons inside a dice box is going to be confusing for consumers to try and differentiate which which company owns which arrangement of hexagons in a dice box. That seems really that seems really dumb and not trademarkable. This is the lowest level of trademark protection even if it has acquired distinctiveness, and I think that also makes it susceptible to abuse. And so that's why I'm calling this tabletop bullies. Uh, the reason why Chris Taylor, Neris, has the right to stand in and oppose is because he is selling or offering a similar design. In fact, it might be the exact same design. We're not sure. Uh, on Thingiverse.com on his profile. So sellers of dice boxes maybe even consumers of dice boxes, but it's probably going to be more sellers and makers of dice boxes, especially those who already sell and make dice boxes of this shape, will be the kind of parties that have standing to oppose it. And as to the audience, what do you think about this situation? If you were at a convention, like a tabletop convention like PAX Unplugged, and you're walking through the aisles and without noticing who the vendor is, if you just saw, if you just saw this inside of a box with nothing more, would you automatically know that was Elderwood Games exclusive property? I say no, but I, I want to hear from you. What do you think in the comments of our video? Well, thank you all for coming. I love you all. I'm looking forward to a great 2020 with you. We are doing the things this year that we've been talking about so for so long, like taking lawful masses to the next level. I wanted to do it by the end of last year, but frankly, if, if any if any one thing did it, it was the dog thing. The go go listen to our podcast if you're a supporter. Most of you here are. The the dog thing and me being charged with harboring a dangerous dog that really broke me for a month there, and that really set everything back. And then I was scrambling to get back to enjoying getting engaged to Kaylee and getting ready to come back to Luxembourg and doing all the things I needed to do with the Leibowitz case and with getting admitted to DC. And now I'm preparing to, to make my application to the Southern District of New York, thanks to the Todd C. Bank opinion. So there's a lot of exciting things happening. It's just, uh, I want it to be farther ahead than we are now, but you know, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans, right? This is a community-supported legal education channel. Thank you to our supporters on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.com slash law. Without your support, this channel would not be possible. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters in the first month of 2020. In January, the $50 plus supporters are As Bernari, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudra, Michael Pierce, Jan Negre, Spirit Bear, Daniel Perez, Snorri Wisotsky, Blackleaf, 
Joe Tyson, Evie, Benjamin Hightoff, Stephen, and Cute Grills in your area, and welcome the new supporter, Ada. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the screen in front of me. All of your support is absolutely invaluable to us. We are looking forward to starting to drop our videos on Floatplane, which is a new video service that is not really uh, the same as YouTube. It's a little bit different. We're gonna do kind of a launch video on that and explain what the differences are and why you might join us on one platform instead of the other. So look for that as well. I'll see you in the videos that drop this week. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I love you all. Bye.